Nancy. My girlfriend and me got kidnapped last night. And you didn't call last night when this occurred? I was tied up. Tell me what happened. I wake up. Bright light blinding us. Taser goes off. And I see they're wearing wetsuits. What, what, did they swim in? So what happens next? That has to need to tie my hands behind my back. Did she like discover something? Some text messages. Is she mad? Oh, she's you cheating? There's blood in your house. Do you know where she is? I didn't do anything. Yeah, you did. Oh my God, it's her. I just got a message. She's walking over to my house. I've never heard of a case where the kidnappers drop their victim at the front door of their house. We thought she's this innocent victim. She looks more like a suspect. Police now wondering, is Huskins a real life God girl? Something else has happened here. Maybe this is about revenge. We find zip ties, toy guns, and a blow-up doll. Can this get any stranger? Who's really behind all of this? And they get an email confessing to the crime. Did we all get this wrong? That was the trailer for the Netflix docuseries, American Nightmare. And this is Factual America. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood. Each week I watch a hit documentary and then talk with the filmmakers and their subjects. After a home invasion and abduction, a young couple's recounting of the events is too far-fetched for the police to believe. Why did the victim seem so calm? Was it all a hoax? From the filmmakers behind The Tender Swindler, this three-part docuseries unravels the consequences of our cultural rush to judgment and the damage done when law enforcement and the media decide the truth can't possibly be true. Joining us to discuss this riveting series are the acclaimed co-directors, Bernie Higgins and BAFTA-winning and Emmy-nominated Felicity Morris. Stay tuned. Felicity Morris, Bernadette Higgins, welcome to Factual America. How are things with you, Felicity? Very well, thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, it's great to have you on. Bernadette, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. Yes, uh, we're just to remind everyone, we're talking about the f- uh, three-part docuseries, American Nightmare, releases on January 17th uh, on uh, Netflix. Uh, 8 a.m. GMT, for those of you who are just curious, if you're in California, you can get a really early start uh, or stay up late on the 16th and watch it. Uh, but um, So congratulations, great to have you on. Uh, you must be really excited uh, to get this, uh, this one in the can and out there, and it's to you know released on Netflix. Uh, how are you feeling about it, Felicity? Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it um, coming out, really looking forward to the conversations that will hopefully be sparked as a result of you know people watching um yeah i think we're we're excited for it to drop and to to hear people's thoughts well for many people if they have and i'll I'll, i'm gonna say something about this in a minute but we'll start off with as we always start off with is uh i'm gonna start with you felicity asking you what is american nightmare all about maybe you can give us a, a synopsis american nightmare is about a home invasion that happens in the middle of the night to a couple, Denise and Aaron, a young couple, um, 29, recently started dating. In the middle of the night, people break into their home. Denise is kidnapped. Aaron is drugged. He goes to the police the following morning, tells the police what has happened, and he's not believed. And unbeknownst to Aaron. Meanwhile, Denise is 
driven miles away from mm. their home and is held captive. She's sexually assaulted and is released by her kidnapper, by the kidnappers, um, at, by which point the police have basically um, come up with their own version of events, their own story, believing that, the you know, first of all, that Aaron had killed Denise, not believing his story. And then when Denise is released, believing that she, in fact, is a hoaxer and has made this up. And before they've even had the chance, before they've even taken the time to interview her, the police go on national television and call her a hoaxer. And she's known to the world thereafter as the real gone girl. So it's about a horrific event, a, hor a horrific crime that happens to this young couple um, and the consequences of that. Mm. And so that's, now for some of you who maybe haven't seen it, now you're thinking, wow, there's a lot of, there are a lot of twists and turns there already. Uh, there are more. They're, they seem to come at, uh, at a fairly rapid pace throughout the, the series. Um, but Bernadette, it's, you know, this, even I was watching the first 10 minutes of, of episode one. I mean, not to, I mean, I, I, it's, it's, it's interesting because it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm watching this and it's like, this is, this feels like other true crime. It's, uh, but it, you know, it's almost American murder, the family next door again. It kind of has that feel very, f those first 10 minutes or so. Um, and as you've already, as, as, as Felicity's already mentioned that things aren't necessarily what they seem, are they? But that's actually the theme. I mean, it's not the main thing, but that is a theme of the whole series. It does yeah. seem like every once you think you know or have an idea, even once it becomes even clearer what's what has really happened, um, it it always seems like there's something else that drops that you 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 didn't didn't expect. Yeah, and American Murder Next Door is a great reference, actually, a brilliant film by Jenny Popplewell, and one that we talked about a lot in the avid because it's is the one that we think people will be most kind of mindful of during mm. those first 10 minutes because it is so similar, you know, the police turning up, the body right. cam footage. And, you know, it does start off like your classic true crime right. story. Um, and we were very conscious of that and we deliberately played into that. Um, and that's why we structured the series the way that we did um, and why we never wanted the audience to be ahead of the law enforcement who are investigating it at the time. Because, you know, unfortunately, the fact of the matter is that usually right. when women go missing, it is because they've, you know, right. fallen foul of the hands of their boyfriend or husband. And so therefore, we knew that that's what the audience would probably suspect. Like, oh, here we go. It's another Chris Watts. Right. Um, and unfortunately, you know, Aaron, the police did that to Aaron. And that, you know, ended up being their undoing, really, because they had such tunnel vision. Hmm. that that was the only way they were looking at him and, you know, everything that he told them just kind of served their own information bias. And then obviously, you know, there was a lot of circumstantial evidence, which what did not look good for Aaron, you know, right, the, right. the texting with the ex and the right. fact that they'd split up previously and that Denise had been very upset and, you know, it's all playing into that kind of classic, is this, you know, a narcissistic psychopath who's lost his mind and killed his girlfriend. Yeah. You know, and, and we're all armchair psychologists as well as armchair detectives. Exactly. So, people will have been diagnosing them left, right, and center, uh, but including the police, and they're supposed to know better. Um, yeah. So it was a real gift for us to have all of the police interrogation tapes because mm. it gave the audience the chance to have that real active viewing experience. Yeah. You know, everybody gets to play armchair detective and assess our in the same way that the police were. And do we believe this guy? And is this how you really behave if your mm. girlfriend had been taken mm. in the middle of the night? No, he seems a bit calm, doesn't he? So. You know, it was a real gift for us to, to have that footage to play with. And we, that's, you know, it's exactly like you say, we want it to, to very deliberately. And it was a strategic, mm -hmm. creative decision to play into that true crime trope. Right. I mean, what, since you bring it up, and I was going to have a little question, it had some questions on you about what this says about policing and certainly in the US. Mm -hmm. And we could spend a whole episode, many episodes about that, obviously, and you know, all the stuff that's been going on the last few years and continues to go on. But, I mean, with the with these interrogation tapes. Now, I mean, we've seen them in other um, other true crime. I mean, they, these. I'm just curious. Um, is it freedom of information? You just get you ask for them, and they will. They have to turn them over. Is that how it works? And then you've got 
hours of that stuff to go through to to then weave into the into the story. I thought um, it was that simple. Sorry, it was. Just, yeah. um, no, Aaron spent years getting that footage. He was right? diligent about it. Yeah. So, no, it, it's not easy to just get your hands on that tape, and you have to be very. You have to have a very specific reason for doing it. Um, right. But Aaron went through the all the the really arduous, deliberately arduous channels of FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act, right. to get his hands on all of those tapes. So you know he did. He was almost like our documentary producer ahead of time, making sure that we right. had all of that. So that was a real gift for us, and you know really helped enormously in, in the storytelling aspect of it. But yeah, that was all Aaron. We can't yeah. take any credit for that. And then just one last thing on that, uh, Bernie. I mean, is that. It just strikes me every time, like, do these guys not take a class on how to do interrogation and interviews and, and putting people in, you know, the hours, 18 hours or whatever it is, 12 hours straight of interviewing and the stress that puts under people. It's almost like a form of torture. You know, what kind of information are you going to get from them and all that? I mean, it, it just seems to happen way too often. Yeah, well, it is a technique. It's, it's called the read technique, and Aaron could tell you a lot about that because he's studied a lot on, on how this has happened to other people since. Right. But essentially what they're trying to do is to get the story to change. So to just ask the same questions again and again and again and again. And usually if you're lying, it's really hard to remember a lie. So right. it's quite easy to remember the truth, but it's hard to remember a lie. So they're hoping that he'll slip up. Right. But of course the thing is, and you know what the police ignored in this situation is that he ne his story never changed, right. and it was in minute detail. And instead of taking that as thinking, well, actually, maybe he's telling the truth, they're like, oh, well, you know, he's just particularly good at lying. So, yeah, you know, it does beg the question of yeah. what are they doing, but yeah. it speaks for itself, really. And then, Felicity, as you've already mentioned in your very um, yeah, very good synopsis, this, this is, well, I, I don't know if you said this exactly, but certainly, you know, then the suspicion falls on the victim, well, the other victim, but especially the victim, uh, Denise uh, Huskins. And uh, they do think it's an elaborate hoax. And you were saying about, I think we, I, we mentioned referencing um, uh, American Murder and the family, family Next Door. That would actually hadn't been released yet. So the, what they're referencing is Gone Girl, and you even name your second episode two Gone Girl. Um, and... It just seems so, again, another, it's almost so cliche that, okay, well, we now know it wasn't the boyfriend, so obviously the woman's lying. Yeah, I think by that point, the detectives, you know, they had sort of such strong confirmation bias that it was a case of, you know, any part, any fact that we're told within the story, if it doesn't fit the story that we want this to be, then we're going to dismiss it. But with Denise, the police, the Vallejo police, didn't even speak to her before they went on right. national television and called her and Aaron liars, you know, to the world. They hadn't even heard what had happened to her from her. So, you know, that's the kind of, one of the most jaw dropping parts of this story is how can that happen? How can that happen to a victim like Denise, to any victim? Hmm. And, and you use the term jaw-dropping. I've actually, I do have some notes in front of me, and I have that term used as well. There's a lot of these jaw-dropping revelations that, uh, the, the ones we're talking about and ones that just even sort of side revelations that happen. I mean, how much of that, and I'll just direct that to you again, Felicity, how much of those did you know about already going in, and how much of that is part of the filming process? You know, as you're putting stories together, you can't believe, wait a minute, that person had a relationship with that person. Did anyone know about that? I think that, you know, with Denise and Aaron, Bernie and I spent hours and hours and hours on Zoom calls with them before mm -hmm. we even started thinking about how we would shape this series, you know, what the kind of twists mm -hmm. and turns might be, how to hold back, you know, all of the things that go into making these films and series is, you know, how do we hold back information so that when we when we tell it, it has the most impact and it lands with the most mm. impact? But, you know, Bernie and I don't really leave a stone unturned in the research process. Um, and, um, you know, spoke with Denise, Aaron, the other contributors in this um, for mm. four hours. 
So therefore that meant that, you know, as well as having the archive that we had, as well as having the police reports, um, as well as having, you know, the, the news archive, mm. you know, all of this material, we then kind of spend weeks working into a kind of a Bible, uh, a script, right. uh, really, as to sort of how we see at that point that the, the series will shape up. And that kind of helps mm. us then when we um, get into the interviews with people that we sort of make sure that we don't forget anything or that we, um, you know, that we've heard what's important for the people that we're interviewing and make sure that we kind of cover it. And um, we're basically just there we always say we're just there as kind of guide rails, sort of helping these people tell their stories in 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 the best way. But in Denise and Aaron, we had obviously such compelling story tellers right. that they made our jobs very easy. Um, so there were there weren't, I don't think, enormous revelations when we were working with the Dublin Police Department who come into episode three. Right. There were material there was material that they gave us that we hadn't that we hadn't okay. seen before. Um, and that was, you know, in, interesting to interesting mm. to look at, interesting to explore, um, and you know, then sort of great material to kind of work its way into into the edit and how we mm. how we sort of told the the, the story of episode three. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't think that anything came as a, a shock, apart from obviously the the shocking parts of this story, which still, you know, yes. make us draw breath when we yeah. think about them now. Yeah. Um, com well, I completely agree about that. Uh, we'll be right back. I think this is a good time to take a quick break. So uh, we'll be right back with uh, Felicity Morris and Bernie Higgins, the award-winning filmmakers behind the Netflix docuseries American Nightmare, releasing on January 17th. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or X to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with the filmmakers Felicity Morris and Bernadette Higgins, Netflix docuseries American Nightmare. It's releasing on January 17th, or maybe I should say released January 17th, because you're likely not to hear this until that day or afterwards. Um, Bernadette, we've uh, we've been talking about uh, you know sort of the the, the, the project, you know, the film, and the project. How did you all become involved with this project? I mean, obviously, it's a, it's a very compelling story. So, I imagine there were a lot of people wanting to make this doc. So, uh, how did you how did you two get involved? Uh, well, we were very lucky that the production company making it was Raw, um, who we yeah. had just made the Tinder Swindler with. Right. Um, and they, you know, there was a diligent team getting access to Denise and Aaron for two years. Um, mm. It was a, it was a long process. You know, they were very, they were being very selective about who they wanted to make the film with. Right. Uh, but Raw obviously have a stellar reputation when it comes to telling these kinds of stories. Right. And then we were just lucky that the timing worked out that it came about just after the release of Tinder. Um, Fliss and I had decided that we already wanted to do our next project together as well. Yeah. Um, and it was brought to us. And you know, the, the first question we always ask ourselves, you know, aside from, you know, because obviously we want to tell a twisty, turny, com twisty, turny, compelling, exciting right, right, story, right, right. but not without good reason. Yeah. So not just yeah. rehashing a traumatic story for the sake right. of entertainment. Um, so the first question we always ask ourselves is why? You know, yes. why would we tell this story? What's the point? What's the takeaway yeah. for the viewer aside from, you know, two and a bit hours of entertainment right and there are so many compelling themes that run through this series that we just really wanted to get our teeth into so whether it be you know that the um confirmation bias that mm. law enforcement uses again and again and but you know especially for us as female filmmakers you know a very compelling element of this was how denise was treated mm. and you know which is unfortunately not unusual yeah um but it gave us an opportunity to really dig into that. You know, why are our female uh, victims of sexual assault so often treated as suspects? Why is there so much pressure for them to prove that something has happened? And, and what was particularly interesting about this was, you know, you hear often a lot of the reasons that, 
you know, less than 20 percent of rape school reported is because they fall into this, you know, gray area, you know, date rape mm -hmm. or he said, she mm -hmm. said. This was clearly not a he said, she said situation. You know, somebody came into this woman's home in the middle of the night and forcibly took her and, and abducted her for 48 hours. So that's not a he said, she said. And still the police didn't believe her. So it really was an opportunity for us to address a lot of, of mm. a lot of how uh, victims of female se victims of sexual assault are treated and how they're viewed by the public and how we assess victims and how we think we have the right to judge them on the way that they're behaving and is it the way that we think we would behave and are they believable and it's just mm. deeply disturbing but you know we were very lucky that we had this incredible access to a woman who'd been through such a traumatic event and was willing to share it on such a huge platform. Mm. So, you know, we were very mindful of that and we were we really thought this is a this is an opportunity to really make people question themselves. And and, you know, once you turn off the TV, turn to the person beside you on the sofa and think, God, what did you think? Or how did you feel about her? And and and, mm. and really make make ourselves question how we treat people. So that was what we really wanted to mm. to address in the series. I, and and Felicity, I mean, I think Bernie was already saying, I mean, they were very, uh, obviously, uh, Denise and Aaron were very careful about who they were going to make this film with. So it says a lot about you that uh, they decided to, to make it with, with you all. But they must have, I mean, even so, they must have been very reluctant to re have to relive this again. I mean, because it is so traumatic for both of them, but especially for Denise. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she... I mean, maybe I think she says, well, I think it becomes evident at certainly by the end why, but why is Denise so willing to put herself through this pain again? Um, I mean, the reason why she wants to put herself through this pain again is so that people, um, you know, can bear witness to her story yeah. and, and so that she can be heard. You know, the point at which Denise was you know, called the real gone girl in the press mm. was the point at which this story picked up the most momentum and, you know, was being um, covered, you know, on nearly every news outlet in, in America. Um, and, you know, thereafter, the months, in the months after, you know, when Denise and Aaron were finally vindicated, vindicated thanks to the, you know, the mm. work of the Dublin police and Misty Caruso, um, you know, there was very, very little media coverage of that. So I think for Denise and Aaron, you know, there are people that probably left the story at the point that they were known as hoaxes right. and that they'd, right. you know, conned America. Um, and so for them, I think, you know, this is an opportunity for them to have a, their story told definitively. Um, you know, we're very privileged to have been able to partner with them. There's the executive producer on this, Rebecca North, who works at Raw, you know, she had she sort of was the person who worked for a number of years to carefully get right. the access to the two of them. Yeah. Um, but for them, you know, they want their story to be told. They want people to hear what happened to them so that, you know, hopefully change can be made, lessons can be learned. Um, you know, these, these, so that these stories are kind of looked at, looked at in a different way. And I think that that was, you know, a big part for, Bernie and I in 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 kind of figuring out how to approach this and how to tell this was you know we made the deliberate decision obviously in the Tinder Swindler to put the victims front and center right. um, and tell the story from their point of view and that was certainly you know what we wanted to do with this and not sort of give a voice to the perpetrator of the crime um, but no Denise and Aaron have written a book um, I okay. think there's a scripted project in the works their book's called Victim F. And so, you know, they, as hard as it is to go over the awful things that happened to them and particularly Denise, they, they want this to be out there for people to see, and people to learn from. Okay. And, and Bernie, in terms of these lessons in Europe, we were talking earlier also about policing and information, you know, this, the bias and tunnel vision. I mean, what... You know, besides raising the, this as your as your series does so well, um, I mean, what is what, what can we do? What is happening? Or do you see so, you know do you see signs that policing is finally um, learning less these lessons, or are we just going to be keep repeating this? 
I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we. I, I mean, I'm not I expecting guess, you to be a policing <laughs> expert, right? But I mean, well, we don't. We yeah. don't get to hear about the stories when when good policing is done as much. To be honest and, with you. And I was going to say, give Dublin, California, yeah, exactly. uh, uh, well, uh, some credit. You know, they did exactly. it right. Yeah. And that was really important to us because you know. Fliss and I have no beef with the police and, and with right. law enforcement. You know, we don't have any axe to grind. We're not trying to, hmm. you know, defund the police or anything like that. But this happened and it happens a lot. Right. And if it can happen to Denise and Aaron, it can happen to anyone. And, you know, that's a really important point that they really wanted to make in, 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 in coming forward to tell their story as well, because they're yeah. very conscious of their own privilege. They're very conscious of the fact that they are white middle class tertiary mm. educated you know they're not the classic people who mm. fear the police you know there are many right. demographics who have been right. brought up to to not speak to the police until you have an right. attorney but they, it didn't occur to them that they would need an attorney because they're victims so why would they need a lawyer so it's it's, it's learnings like that really um but you know they if they hadn't had the money to pay for an attorney what would have happened and would we ever have heard this story or would they be languishing in jail right now but that's also why, you know, yeah. it was really important and 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 thankfully a kind of hopeful message when it comes to law enforcement that we did have the opportunity to highlight good police work through yeah. the Misty Caruso and, yeah. and the crew at the, the Dublin Police Department because they went above and beyond. So there, it's a spectrum when it comes yeah. to law enforcement and we just have to hope that yeah. good outweighs bad more often than it does. Yeah. Just nowhere near anywhere close to any sort of equating this situation but i was in a bad traffic accident years ago <laughs> and i was laying on a hospital bed and a police per, uh, well it was a police woman in this case came in and started asking me questions about what happened i answered them because i thought well you, they're the police you answer these and my the lawyer we had to get lawyers involved and they're like you should have never said anything to them and i'm like well what how is what i, I mean i was like out of my head on all kinds of painkillers what am i you know, you're you're in a stressful situation, and I can only imagine what they were. You know, the situation like Aaron, and then and certainly Denise are going through. To then, yeah, you you do expect the police to have your best interest at heart, um, mm -hmm. but um, that certainly wasn't the case with the the Vallejo police. Uh, no, unfortunately sure. not. Unfortunately, and what's so scary about this with Denise and Aaron is you know they you know with Aaron obviously they're instead of investigating what he was telling them they mm. set out to get a confession get a confession get a confession and that's not unique but you know Aaron's that's brother right. is in law in law enforcement his brother's in the FBI he trusts the police he yeah. wanted to be compliant and you know it's the same for for, for Denise you know she t told the facts she went into meticulous detail when she sat down with those cops and yet you know at the end of it they didn't believe her and I think for both of them they questioned whether or not this even did did this happen to them yeah. you know their sort of sanity and their you know belief in themselves and their stories were um compromised at that point and that's you know just so unbelievably dangerous isn't it and you know you hear about it all the time of police getting false confessions mm. and you know thankfully Denise you know Aaron eventually asked for a lawyer Denise had Doug Rappaport there advocating right. for her. Yeah. But who knows? Who knows what would have happened had, had that not have been the case. And there's, I mean, there's even, I can't even remember the name of it, but the, there's a scripted series that was out not too long ago where it's a sort Unbelievable. Of, yes. Yeah. That's, that. I kept, I thought of that quite a bit as well. Yeah, it's such a brilliant series. Yeah, because she's like, mm -hmm. yeah, she, she, what, she doubts herself, right? I imagine, Den mm -hmm. I mean, and Denise even talks about these out of body experience. Well, at least with you know, she had to go through this out of body experience, and that's uh, I think a common thing that happens uh, mm -hmm. to victims. Uh, so yeah, must have thought well, maybe maybe I did get something wrong. You know, I, I can only imagine that you know the tra trauma about it. But uh, but yeah, you see that as scripted, and then yet, but I guess unbelievable is based on a true story as well. So yeah, yeah. well, thank you for making this. Um, I, I think it's, you know, uh, really, really, I mean, compelling watching. It's, it's hard to describe something like this as entertaining because you, you don't want it to be about as you've, and I think as you've definitely dealt with it, but it is very, you know, 
I think it's it's one that, uh, in the right way, just shocks us in a way that probably we need to be shocked. I guess in a, you know, without being salacious or or any or any of these things, which you would never be at risk of doing something like that. But some others, less crafted uh, filmmakers, might have. Um, but you know, I think uh, maybe just uh, we. I think we're coming to the end of our our time together. But just. Uh, um just wanted to uh say that um uh, you know uh, it's been great to have you on and um maybe uh what's next you know what what do you guys have in in the works you've got two projects together do you have any anything else in the works oh yeah we've actually started our own production company now um, oh yeah all right <laughs> <laughs> called ladywell films <laughs> so uh we both live in an area called ladywell um okay. so it seemed appropriate Okay. Um, but yeah, we're just building up a slate at the moment. You know, we yeah. want to keep working together. We want to keep telling stories that we think deserve a platform. Um, so yeah, so that's, we're just looking for the next story at the moment. And what's your secret? Because you've, you know, we haven't talked about these other ones, but Tinder Swindler was, has been big. Uh, were you both producers or one of you is producers on Don't Fuck With Cats? Um, yeah, I produce Don't Fuck with Cats. Yeah, so I mean, very you know, you're 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 doing well. Uh, what what do you think your secret is? I think it's well the strength of the story first and foremost. Yeah. The contributors, the interviewees that that tell that story, um, and uh, an incredible surrounding ourselves with just amazing teams um right. you know beyond bernie and i there's obviously so many other people that kind of make these things happen and live and breathe these projects when they're working on them um and uh yeah i think i think that sort of com perfect combination hopefully um you know hopefully works out in the end but you know we've loved working together um and yeah, we're looking forward to finding the next the next show, the next story right. to tell. And then I'm going to ask you one last question, if I may, and it's going to be a, a, to follow on from a conversation we had before we started this episode. Uh, it's a question I've never asked one of our guests. Um, so mm -hmm. you're busy, uh, but it's this time of year. People are looking at uh, what are the best films of the last year or so, and uh, do you manage time to watch other docs? And are there any particular ones from 2023 that you really liked that um, you think are, you know, sleepers or not sleepers? What, what really caught your eye in the last, last year? I, I direct that to both of you. But uh, Bernie, what do you, any, any particular? Uh, Pamela really, really stood out for me. The Pamela Anderson dog. Absolutely loved that. We would have loved, we would have loved to have made that. Um, <laughs> but the, the team at Dorothy Street didn't phenomenal job but again it's kind of you know we're not only interested in female-led stories so we right. don't want to paint ourselves into that corner but to have grown up with Pamela Anderson mm. and to have and it's that classic thing again which kind of is echoed in this story it's kind of what you're fed by the press and, and what you devour right. without really questioning right. you know she was obviously a huge victim of that um, so to give her that platform to tell her story and to allow us to get to know her and, and, and hear what it was like from her perspective, I thought it was a really beautifully told, mm. um, a beautifully crafted film. Um, again, she's a com compelling, gorgeous woman who, who mm. just tells her story so well. But that was a film that really struck with me um, last year. I just loved it so much, really. I'll have to put that on my watch list. What about you, Felicity? Have you not seen it? I have not, no. Oh, you must. Oh, you must. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> um, I loved Still, the Michael J. Fox feature doc. Yeah, yeah. So the editor on that was the editor I worked with on Don't Fuck With Cats. Oh, is that um, right? Yeah. Okay. And, I mean, you know, Bernie and I obviously watch l lots of scripted, unscripted things to kind of help you know, with right. our sort of create creativity and making these series, um, you know, there are movies that really loom large for us, like Women Talking, She mm -hmm. Said. But then also you need relief from from right. the work, I think, and from the kind of types of documentaries that we are making as well. 
Mm. And, you know, I, I watched still about three times and just loved it so much. I thought it was so clever. I thought, you know, Michael J. Fox is, you know, was an amazing interview and, um, the, the visuals, the visualizations that they did, it was, yeah, that was yeah. gold, that film. <laughs> well, and it's likely, or it, once you get to this stage, who knows, but I mean, it's likely to get nominated, isn't it, for, a, for an Academy Award, I think. It's Hopefully, at least, fingers it's, it's, crossed. It's, it's on most people's short list, so we, sh we will find uh, out in a, in a couple weeks' time, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but we don't have to wait that long to see your ser uh, docuseries, so thanks again. Uh, for coming on. Really, really enjoyed having you on. Uh, just a reminder, listeners and viewers, we've been talking with the filmmakers Felicity Morris and Bernie Higgins. Uh, they've just, uh, well, just about to release the uh, uh, American Nightmare on Netflix uh, coming January 17th. So do, do check it out. Thanks again. Great to have you on. Thanks again for joining us on Factual America. A big shout out to everyone at Intersound Audio in York, England for their great studio and fine editing and production skills. A big thanks to Amy Ord, our podcast manager, who ensures we continue getting great guests onto the show and that everything otherwise runs smoothly. Finally, a big thanks to you, our listeners. Please keep sending us feedback and episode ideas, whether it is on YouTube, social media, or directly by email. And please also remember to like us and share us with your friends and family, wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Alamo Pictures, which specializes in documentaries, television, and shorts about the U.S. for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and X. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is factualamerica.com.